Good morning, Living Church. Welcome to our time of worship on a very cold morning and a shopping tip. Warm socks are always a welcome stocking stuffer. We, we learned that on mornings like this. We're so glad that you're here to worship with us as we continue in our series called The Songs We Sing. We want to understand a little bit more of what we're throwing out there into the atmosphere, even in the Christmas carols that we're singing, especially when they have some deep biblical insight to them. As is our habit, if you're able to stand, will you stand with me as we begin in Scripture this morning? And we begin in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, with some very familiar words. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And now these words from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Will you pray with me? Our Lord, we thank you that you are here today, you are active, you are alive, you've given us this word that you have deemed to be preserved so that we can study and read it. But now, Lord, we pray that your living spirit will come and illuminate this word for each one of us who need peace today, for every home, every marriage, every life that needs peace. Come, Prince of Peace, and speak. To us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, it was Christmas Day in 1863 that Henry Wadsworth Longfellow put pen to paper, and he wrote this song, which I will not sing for you. (laughs) I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the, the words repeat of peace on earth goodwill to men. But he couldn't hide his mood and he couldn't hide his despair. In his naked honesty, he wrote this next verse because, after all, it was the middle of the Civil War where 500,000 men were giving their lives on the battlefield. His second wife had been burned fatally in a fire. And his son, whom he did not want to enlist, had enlisted in the army and had been gravely wounded and was lying in a bed, not knowing if he would recover or not. So the poet wrote these next words in this second verse, and in despair I bowed my head, there is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. But he can't just leave it there. He wants to have some kind of hope. And so he throws out this desperate gasp for peace. Even though there's no proof in his life that it's there, even though it lacks traction in his personal experience, the third verse reads, Then peal the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail with peace on earth. Goodwill to men. It's almost a leap from the poet like we often feel in our own hearts. Where is that peace? Where is that prince of peace? We're stretching to grab a hold of a solid theological anchor because we know it's true, but it doesn't have much tangible evidence in my life or my world. Am I hurling my belief out into the void? where I just say the wrong shall fail, the right prevail. But what do I have to cling to right now? Joanne and I were counseling a a friend of ours who is being dragged through a divorce unwillingly. And she has no peace. She says, I'm exhausted, I've got to get some rest, but I can't sleep. 
My daughter tells me I need to take some pictures off the wall and stop remembering, but I I can't make myself do that. It feels like another death. I don't know what I'm going to do financially. I don't know what's going to happen to the house. I don't know what to do about insurance. I don't know who I can trust. I don't know where to take my emotions every day. I have no peace. I want to know what he's doing, but I don't want to know what he's doing. And for 30 years, we've been linked inextricably together, and now it's all being torn. The fabric is just shredding in my life. There's no peace. Does it ever bother you when you sing this song? Do you feel hypocritical sometimes? I'm saying things that I don't really feel. And there are three wonderful names in this chorus in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, and they say, he's the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, and we find in them this heavenly, ethereal, eternal way to worship him, and they're true. But then we come to this one, the fourth one that says, but the Prince of Peace. You see, that seems more measurable, and it often feels like it's missing, Where's the evidence for this nice-sounding title, this ridiculous-sounding claim for me and for my family, for my marriage, for, for Congress, for Brexit, for Israel or Syria or Myanmar? Where is the peace on earth that is the name of the one who was to come? Does it ever feel like we need to kind of qualify our words so we don't outpunt our coverage so, so we don't make bogus claims for our own Messiah that don't seem to be delivered? Because a historian said that peace are the thin white spaces between the chapters in the history books. Out of 4,500 years of known history, recorded history, there are less than 100 years of peace. of the history books are written about war, the run-up to war, the war, and the aftermath of war, and there are 40 wars going on in our planet right now, from Afghanistan to Myanmar, from Syria to Chechnya, from Iraq to Nigeria, with enormous firepower, enormous loss of life, incredible massive atrocities, homelessness, desperation, hunger, sorrow, and displacement. So how do we sing this song by, if it's anything more than folklore? And how do we protect the reputation of our Messiah whose name this is? How does it make a difference in our fractured world? Well, the breakthrough comes when we recognize that the peace that's being talked about, not only in the name of the Messiah, but in his work, is a very different kind of of peace. It's going to be assessed by a different criteria. It arrives at a very, by a diff, very different means, and it's applied in a very different way to our lives. And since Jesus' truth and authenticity is going to be evaluated by his peace quotient, we who are his followers ought to know what this peace applies to. So let me give you three things that are true about this peace. Number one is this. The peace of God is beyond comprehension. Well, that helps a lot, right? So, so we can't understand it. Well, that's not exactly what we mean. What we mean is that we can't bottle it up. We can't get our arms completely around it. It doesn't mean that it's irrational. It doesn't mean that it's illogical. It just means that it's so big, we can't actually get all of our arms around it. As my dad used to say, this stretches our six-inch mind over a seven-inch idea. It's incomprehensible. We approach peace from our need, from our immediate desire, our desire for tranquility or comfort or some, something subjective and visible, but God is approaching peace from a completely different starting point and vantage point. I want to try to illustrate this for you by taking you to uh, a beautiful little town in the foothills of Montana called Butte, Montana. I don't know if there's any Montanans here, but, oh, a few, okay, oh. Well, I hope you're not from Butte, because this is not a flattering picture, but anyway. <clears throat> well, it's a happy little town. 
And here's what the Chamber of Commerce says about Butte, Montana. It's the richest hill on earth built from its bustling mining days. Butte has maintained its sense of community with a can-do attitude that has achieved our city an all-American status. The mining city caters to the outdoor enthusiast. If it can be done outdoors, it can be done in Butte. Butte is a city and a community with a rich, storied past and an ever-promising future where our people are the most valuable resource. That's the Chamber of Commerce invitation to Butte, Montana. And so here we have a city of 34,000 residents. They have schools and playgrounds and parks and stores. They have a bustling downtown area. They have infrastructure and sites all around them and all the clean air you could ever want to breathe. But there is no peace in Butte, Montana. Because they live right next door to a disturbing, sleep-depriving problem on their horizon. Something looming that's been growing for generations, it's been undealt with, and it must be attended to or there will be no peace now, no peace tomorrow, no peace ever, no future. There is no solution to this. It is an existential threat to the city of Butte, Montana. And it cannot be ignored. It's called the Berkeley Pit. A mine began in Butte, Montana in the 1860s. They found a vein of copper there, the richest vein of copper in the world. It was a cubic mile of copper ore. And it started with hundreds of tunnels that comprised thousands of miles of mines. And then in the 1950s, it became an open pit mine as they began to haul all this ore out of this ground. It operated 24-7 for 28 years straight. And they got so much copper out of that mine that you could pave I-35 from here to Albert Lee with six inches deep of copper. That's a lot of copper that they got out of that mine. Well, they closed the mine in 1983. And they stopped pumping the water that was coming into the mine. They began to fill those tunnels. Some of them were a mile deep. And finally, it reached the bottom of the pit, which is 180 stories lower than the streets of Butte, Montana. But it's filling up. It's 5,000 gallons per minute, 7 million gallons per day. It's rising 30 feet per year. It's now approximately 30 feet or 300 feet below the streets of Butte, Montana. But this is no recreational lake. The lake is now 1,500 feet deep. It's a mile in diameter. And the water is filled with nickel, lead, arsenic, and zinc. It has the pH of battery acid or lime juice. Waterfowl that land in it die in it. It's a huge toxic bathtub. It's the largest body of severely contaminated water in the United States of America. There are high rates of cancer, kidney disease, and learning disabilities because of the lead in the water and the surrounding area. Generations have suffered because of this. And when the people of Butte reflect for a moment, when they drive beyond their little suburb and look at what is looming on the horizon, there's an, a monumental ecological scar, a mounting ecological and health disaster. Yet the Chamber of Commerce chirps this happy message. Quote, eventually the water will be cleaned at the water treatment plant. But in the meantime, the pit gives Butte a lake like none other, (laughs) as well as giving researchers a unique challenge. Well, that sounds like spraying a little perfume on a manure pile. (laughs) It's an insoluble, mounting, toxic bathtub of problems. And hanging Christmas wreaths on the light posts in Butte, 
is not going to make for a happy day. And singing carols down the main street and chanting optimistic slogans and doing all these things doesn't stop the looming disaster that is happening. Well, I want to use this as a metaphor, as a microcosm of our world. You see, we have a problem here. And it's not about our surface peace, and it's not about our daily commerce, and it isn't about some of the happy thoughts we talk about in our schools or the, even sitting down to a meal here. We have an unsolvable problem that's been mounting in our world. We have a toxic, ecological, personal, spiritual disaster that's happening. And all the talk about peace and all the things about emotional peace and political peace and personal peace is just whistling in the dark unless we take care of the problem, which is mounting every day. And we have no clue how to save ourselves. Everything we're doing in the UN, all our talk about civility, is just mere cosmetics to this enveloping, undeniable, blamable mess we're in. And you know what the Bible calls it? Sin. Sin is that reservoir that's been mounting since the first couple, ate of the fruit, and we're banished from Eden. Sin is that evil greediness that I have, that you have, that insists on my way, my wants, my comforts. Sin is me digging down and mining for my pleasures and my relief and my advantage, regardless of the collateral damage that it might cause. Sin is that juicy enjoyment we get from another person's failure. Sin is that perversion of special talents that I've been given, you've been given to gain power and notoriety. Sin is the corruption of position to perpetuate injustice and fraud and cruelty. And then we have all the after effects of that, the separation, the the dysfunction in families, the the hurt and woundedness, the estrangement, the restlessness, the lack of peace. And then on top of that, we can see the literal physical damage of sin in our world because it's displayed in hunger and war and addiction and death. And we feel the dread when we think about it. If we stop for a moment and go beyond the outskirts of our little happy town and we look at the problem that we all face, it's sobering. It's an existential threat to you and to me. And the Bible reveals this pit to us on every page. And my contribution to this rising toxic tide And then the Spirit of God comes along and forces me to taste the tang and the acidic burn on my tongue of my own sins. Now, in the Old Testament, the word for peace is the word shalom. I sign most of my emails and letters with shalom. Some people think I'm saying slalom, but it's shalom. (laughs) Shalom. Shalom. And we, every one of us, and every generation before us, have vandalized shalom, God's shalom. Shalom or peace means more than just a cessation of hostility or a ceasefire or some kind of subjective peace of mind. Shalom means the universal flourishing and wholeness and delight that we were made for. One theologian said, shalom is the way things ought to be. It's the way God made them. And it's been spoiled, corrupted, corroded, with no solution in sight. But now let's take a sharp right turn here because all of this morose diagnosis is exactly why the prince The man with authority, the man who has kingship, this is why the prince 
of peace came. He came to fix this. From the outside where we are helpless, he came to reinstitute shalom on the earth, to set things right, to bring shalom. And this plan is incomprehensible to us. But the birth of Jesus in history is the inauguration of that redemption plan, of that restoration, that massive galaxy-wide reclaiming of everything that's been lost and polluted and bring it back to the way it ought to be. So for your worship and for your astonishment in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, it says this, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, by the way, including our testimony that he's the Prince of Peace. Don't be ashamed to call him the Prince of Peace, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, and get this next phrase, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before The ages began. God is not surprised by the Berkeley pit, the stewy stench of what sin has caused in the world. And before it ever began, before anything ever began, before the ages began, much less before creation began, God was already planning to send the Prince of Peace for the greatest super fund ever imagined to clean this up. Now, theologians like to talk about the decrees of God, and they try to get into the mind of God, which is a, a, a pretty arduous task. And, and it's kind of like, what did God know and when did he know it? It's pretty an pretty arrogant question to ask, but really it's theologians saying, well, if I were God, here's the way I would have done it. But anyway, they're, they're talking about things like supralapsarianism and infralapsarianism and gluten intolerance and a bunch of other stuff. But, you know, big words about, you know, did, did God choose to create and then allow the fall and then elect? Did God choose to elect? And then, you know, what's the logical process that makes sense to us according to the word of God? But ultimately, this is futile because all of God's thoughts are instant. All of God's thoughts are complete. All of God's thoughts are eternal. He thought it all at once. And so he's not surprised. He isn't surprised by the fix We are in, which we've made ourselves. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. And so now we understand better Matthew 1.21, which says he came to save his people from their sins. And you may say, well, what practical good is this? Well, Romans chapter 11 draws us to this. Paul says in verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom of the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. I don't know what practical good this is, but I know what spiritual good this is, and that is that God has not abandoned the pit, and God has a plan for us, and Jesus, the Prince of Peace, shows us by the end of Revelation that there will be not only new people, but there will be a new heaven and a new earth because God has come to reclaim the shalom that was vandalized. What an incomprehensible plan and how this draws draws us to awe and worship of the Lord. The second thing about this peace is this. Peace with God is beyond our capability. It's beyond our capability. What is the ultimate reason for Jesus' birth 
and death on the cross. It's not, first of all, to make peace on earth. It's to make peace with God. The deep purpose and assignment of Jesus is not how to make a frustrated humanity happy, but how to satisfy the righteous justice of a holy God. Because sin is very personal. Sin is not just lawlessness, it's faithlessness. Sin is the slap in the face of the Father saying, I won't. Sin is the rejection of His wisdom. Sin is the repudiation of God's way and His warnings. Sin is contrariness to His obvious and stated intentions, and sin is rebellion against simple obedience. It's very personal. And God, the holy God, has been wronged and offended, and Jesus came to expiate that sin, to pay the price for my sin, so that God would be satisfied and then his love would be released toward me and toward you. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should have everlasting life. Jesus came to make peace with God so that the peace of God could be mine and yours. In the 1970s, I remember reading this many years ago, they, on a remote island in the Philippines, and there were thousands of islands there, they found some Japanese soldiers who were still fighting World War II, still guarding their posts, still wearing the tatters of their old uniforms, still standing guard and cleaning their rifles. And and they found, they saw these guys, and they approached them very carefully. And they approached them and said, hey, hey, bro, it's peace. Peace has broken out. The war is over. You can put down your arms because you're no longer at war with another power. This is the gospel that comes to us. Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, has made peace with the Father so that the Father is calling us, will you make peace with me? Will you lay down your arms? Will you you give up your running? Will you come in from your fences? Will you become a son or a daughter who comes home in peace. Peace with God is beyond my capability, but Christ has made that peace. This baby boy with a body temperature of 98.6, wrapped in swaddling clothes and totally dependent, was the earthly opening act in the best news ever, that God is redeeming a planet through the prince who now climbs the throne and is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. He's going to put this whole seething mess of rebellion and addiction and lust and selfishness that separated me from God, he's going to put it away. And I'm pronounced clean, faultless, and born again. I think this is a quote from C.S. Lewis. I love it. It's scandalous of God to let people off as though they hadn't done a thing. But that is the scandal God is involved in. Apparently, he's less concerned with making examples of people than he is with ending the rule of sin and guilt in human lives. Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Have you seen the protesters who say, no justice, no peace? That's a spiritually true principle. If there had been no justice on the cross, there would be no peace for me. But Jesus has made that happen. And finally, this peace from God is beyond understanding. Finally, now we arrive at where most of us start. We we come to the subjective, the experiential, the personal side of this. How do I find peace in the rough and tumble of my life? When everything seems all wrong, how can I find anything that's right? And what we find at this place is that this peace is fresh grace 
every day. It is new. It's warm. We have a friend wherever we go. How do I know this personal peace? Well, the best gift you could have this Christmas is to receive nothing. Zero. I don't mean zero degrees. You're going to get that. I don't mean Coke Zero or a Zero candy bar. What I mean is, wouldn't you love to rise on Christmas morning or at the Orthodox time of opening gifts, Christmas Eve, (laughs) and find somebody who would say, I have paid your mortgage. You owe zero. Your debt is paid. I've paid your college debt. You're free to go about the country. (laughs) Wouldn't it be great if you could rise and say there's zero tension between me and anyone else because I've forgiven them. As God in Christ forgave me, I have let them out of jail and there's nothing left for them to pay. Wouldn't it be great to have zero sleepless nights this year because your fear has been dissolved in the peace of Christ in your life. To have zero guilt, zero regret, zero pressure to be somebody that you're not because you've met a living Savior who says, you have great works to do which I planned beforehand that you should do, so walk in them today. It'd be a great gift to get nothing for Christmas. And that would be the shalom, the way it's supposed to be, where all the offenses, all the wrongs, all the darkness is erased because I have this relationship with the God of the universe. This, my friends, is the good news of the gospel, and this is what Jesus promised in John chapter 14, verse 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Jesus promised us this, and then in Philippians chapter 4, we have this daily exercise to regain the peace. The peace that was incomprehensible for us to make, the peace that we were not capable to bring, but now the peace that He can give to us. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, it says, do not, let, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You have a friend. He not only lives around you, he lives in you. He is the very spirit of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Will you let him reign over the troubles and the stresses, the independence and the isolation that all of us so easily practice and so easily forfeit the peace we could have? This is the gospel, friends, for all of us desperados and runaways and polluters and despoilers of shalom. This is a peace that comes from the outside, This is a peace that's been paid for, and therefore, this is a peace beyond understanding that you can have in your life. It becomes because there's shalom in the heart for those who worship the Prince of Peace. Because now we know how this is going to end. Now we know that nothing can be brought against me from Almighty God because it's been paid for. And now we know that he walks with me every day, in every place, in all moods, in all conditions. He is the Prince of Peace. Will you pray with me? Lord, we humble ourselves over these majestic ideas that are so huge and incomprehensible. But we know they're true because They've been declared and they've happened in history and Lord, we know when we walk with you in fellowship, we know your presence. We feel 
your peace. Lord, I pray for peace over this congregation, that in the midst of all of our varied emotions that you will speak your peace to us, keep us walking toward the truth that you have and waiting for answers that you will give. But Lord, we thank you that in the vastness of eternity past, you knew exactly where we would be. You provided everything we need, and you are here today. So, Lord, speak to us individually for our own need for this peace. And thank you for granting it lavishly and generously today. In Jesus' name, amen.